Joseph Goldstein, thank you so much for doing this. Um, as you know, I've been harassing you for close to a year to come on this show. So it is, uh, it's really wonderful to connect with you and have you on. Welcome, welcome to the show. Thanks, Dan. Glad to be here. Glad, glad to have you. Um, in doing some research for this conversation over the last couple of days, I, you know, one of the first things that struck me in your biography is that you were born, I think, within a couple of weeks of D-Day. Um, if I remember correctly, it was May yeah. of 1945 when when you were born. 44. 44. Sorry, 44. Yeah. Uh, just before the invasion, and yeah. you know, we're we're sitting here having this conversation in the springtime of 2022, and a lot has happened in history during that time. But one of the, I think, uh, shifts and additions that have has happened in American culture in my lifetime, and you have certainly witnessed this and played a key role in shepherding a lot of the knowledge that has, I think, changed our cultures in many, in many ways is the merging of the East and West and taking Eastern religious ideas, Eastern religious philosophies and, and bringing them to America and the Western world in general. And I would love to maybe start this conversation by learning about who you were after you graduated from Columbia. You know, I, I, I believe that year was 1965. Right. Um, and that took you from New York City, you know, the epicenter of intellectual life, cultural life to Asia. Who was Joseph Goldstein at that time? And what do you remember about your own story as to what made you make that kind of a leap and have that kind of curiosity about that part of the world? Um, so, uh, as you say, I was, uh, an undergraduate at Columbia, uh, and by my junior year, I was just ready to get out. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to get, you know, finish school and see the world. Yeah. Um, as it happens during my junior year, uh, the Peace Corps held a training for a group going overseas uh at barnard college which is at that time was the women's part of columbia now it's more integrated and i happened to meet uh some of those uh peace corps trainees and they just inspired me you know the thought of okay this is this is a way to go explore the world and it was really no more than that uh when i applied to go to the peace corps i actually applied to go to east africa hmm. because I just had some kind of romantic notion about climbing Mount Kilimanjaro. And <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what was in my mind. Yeah. Uh, but fortunately, in a way, uh, they decided to send me to Thailand, you know, and I um, went to Thailand. I was teaching English right in Bangkok. And while I was there, um, I started going to some discussion groups. Um, that were led by Buddhist monks for Westerners. Uh, I had studied philosophy at Columbia, yeah. and so I had a, a general philosophic interest, but, but I didn't really know much at all about Buddhism. Um, <laughs> when I went to these discussion groups, uh, you may have heard this story before, it's, uh, I asked so many questions in these groups that people stopped coming. Because I, <laughs> I was one of those very annoying people. Yeah. <laughs> you know, just wouldn't be quiet. Uh, and so I think out of some desperation, one of the monks said, uh, Joseph, why don't you try meditating? Yeah. I knew nothing about it. I was young, you know, I was 20, 21 years old. It was all very exotic to me. Uh, so sure, I'd like to try that. Got my paraphernalia together. Um, he gave me the most just very basic instructions of sitting, you know, feeling the breath. Tried it. I said, at first, I set my alarm clock for five minutes. Yeah. You know, so I didn't want to sit too long. But something happened. Something really quite extraordinary happened, even in that first five minutes. And it wasn't any great enlightenment experience. It was just that I saw right away that there was a way to look into the mind as well as looking out through it. Mm. And to me, that was revelatory, that there was actually a methodology for looking at the mind, the nature of the mind. 
and it hooked me. I just got completely fascinated uh, by that possibility, and that was really the beginning yeah. you know, of my interest in Buddhism and meditation. There are two quotes that I wanted to start uh, the conversation <laughs> with and to read out to you that I think are, are related to this. And I think generally the people that will be listening to this are Westerners who have probably heard in vogue phrases like mindfulness and and Buddhism, but are, may not have certainly the expertise that, that you have accumulated over your career. And these are two very simple ideas that I wanted to introduce. Um, the first is the quality of your mind is the quality of your life. It's an idea that uh, I have thought about a lot and have written down and kind of come back to because of, I think, how true it is. And the second is, this is from your book, Mindfulness. If you want to understand your mind, sit down and observe it. When you first were that curious character who was going into those classes and pestering the teacher with endless questions, where were you spiritually at that time in your life? Where were you in terms of your you know, just general philosophical outlook on, on the world? And I'm wondering, you, know, you clearly have dedicated your life to um, how, how much these experiences formed you and influenced you. Um, take us back to that time when you were first engaging with some, with meditation and with Eastern religious philosophies, where were you spiritually and philosophically at that time? Uh, <laughs> I was really no place. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, I, this was all completely new to me. You know, uh, I didn't grow up with, with any particular strong, um, religious practice. You know, it was Jewish background, but it was more cultural than yep. religious, really. Uh, and at Columbia, I was studying philosophy, so it was quite kind of intellectual. Um, but I remember even in college, I was a little frustrated with the studying of philosophy mm -hmm. because it was more about learning what these different philosophers said and being able to talk about it rather than how to live one's life. Mm. And so somehow, even though I, at the time, I don't think I could have articulated it that way, I think that's what was driving me. It's like, I wanted to understand my mind. And as if you remember, and probably, you know, when people look back to when they were 20, 21 years old, it's just, the, for me anyway, there was a lot of confusion. You know, I didn't, I didn't really know who I was, you know, in some fundamental sense. I didn't really know what I was looking for. Uh, I remember at one point in the, when I was in the Peace Corps, and all of this was kind of roiling, you know, mm -hmm. in my being, sort of that youthful angst yeah. about life and trying to just make some sense of it, you know, and the role of emotion and thought and how it all fits together. It was all a mystery. And I remember at one point, so, you know, I was that age in Bangkok teaching. And I remember in my room, just looking in my mirror one day and really wanted to find out who is behind the image that I'm seeing. Yeah. I saw my face in the mirror, but that didn't answer the question. Yeah. It's like, What's behind it? So then when I was first introduced to this, to a methodology for looking into the mind, that's why it was so powerful and so captivating. You know, it was exactly what I was looking for, even though it was just the very beginning of discovery. Yeah. You know, it's not that it's not that I learned anything in that first five minutes, except that there was a way to look. Yeah. What did you find? You know, that, as you said, that, that was the beginning to a lifetime of devotion to insight and meditation. What did you begin to experience or conclude for yourself that, you know, influenced you, that really hooked you on this stuff to the point where you thought there was a there there? You thought there was something worth devoting yourself to? 
it was pretty immediate. Yeah. Uh, you know, it wasn't really a process. Uh, I knew right from the first that there was something here. And then at the very end of my Peace Corps days, so this, this was a two year volunteer stint. Uh, as I say, I was teaching English. But right at the end of that time, uh, I was with a friend uh, and they were reading a Tibetan text. We were sitting in, we were sitting in uh, his garden and he was just reading this very powerful text about looking into the mind. And for some reason, my mind was very concentrated and still. And as I was listening to this text, something really happened. There, there was there was a kind of opening to a transformative understanding, you know, and it, it was a glimpse of the selfless nature of this mind-body process. Now that is a key a key aspect of the Buddhist teachings, and one that's not easy to understand. Mm. You know, so when I had this experience, that was like, it was like an earthquake. Yeah. I mean, everything was turned inside out in a whole radically different way of understanding uh, emerged from that. What was interesting is that I hadn't yet developed real meditative skill. You know, so I didn't know. I didn't know what to do with that experience. Yeah. You know, it had transformed my understanding in some way. But now what? Yeah. You know, was, I came back to America. I tried to, in a way, reconstitute it again. You know, I, but I realized quite quickly that I needed a teacher. You know, that it was just too confusing and, and, uh, yeah, confusing on how to proceed. So that's what motivated me to go back to Asia. Mm. Uh, and I thought I would go back to Thailand, but I stopped in India on the way, traveled around looking for a teacher and ended up in Bodh Gaya, which is the place of the Buddha's enlightenment, where I met my first teacher, uh, Munindraji. And he, he is the one who said that line you mentioned in the beginning, if you want to understand your mind, sit down and observe it. And the common sense quality of that statement, it just makes so much sense to me. Yeah. You know, how else can we understand our minds except by observing? Them? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that was, that was the beginning. I know that, um, it, you know, meditation in general, I think has really taken off in, in my lifetime certainly and i i know in yours as well and i think it is largely viewed as a methodology or a practice that has a hope of really improving people's psychological states and in my you know amateur exposure to meditation at, at times in my life when i've taken it very seriously it it has it has done that for me it might be helpful you just mentioned the Buddha, it, it might be helpful to provide to a largely Western audience some context here as to who this man was and what he, you know, in your judgment, was really all about as a philosopher, as a thinker. How do you explain who the Buddha was and how do you detail what's important to remember about his life and his, his teachings? All this in two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's quite a challenging question. Yes. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll give it a shot. <laughs> Thank you. So the actual dates of the Buddhist life are a little controversial, so, uh, but they're around. Uh, there are different, there are different opinions, but about 500, 400 BC, it's in that area is when he lived. And he was a historical person, um, who grew up as uh, a young prince of a kind of principality in India. Um, 
And then uh, as a young man, he came across, he had led a very sheltered life. As a young man, he came across as he was traveling around, you know, his, his land, his mm -hmm. country. Uh, he came across a sick person, an old person, a corpse, and then a wandering mendicant. And it may be hard for us to imagine this, this could be partially mythological, uh, but it symbolizes what it was that motivated the Bodhisattva, which is the name given to him before he became a Buddha or an enlightened one. Mm. So a Bodhisattva is somebody on the path to Buddha. Um, seeing these three universal aspects of life, which later were called the heavenly messengers, mm. you know, because they are messengers to us about the impermanent and in a way fragile nature of life. It's the nature, if we're born, we will age, we will get sick, we will die. And this is just, this is natural law. It's not really a mistake and it's not tragic either. Mm. It's just the nature. Uh, it's the nature of life. It's the nature of everything that comes into being will also pass away. Yeah. But seeing this in the way the story is described, that he saw this for the first time, and it kind of just uh, just awakened in him this overwhelming desire to find a release from this cycle of birth and death and birth and death. Because in in India at that time and until today, and in, in part of the Buddhist teachings, is the idea of rebirth. Yeah. You know, so it's not just this life. So he's, so he understood these phenomena in the context, you know, of this endless cycle of birth and death. And he was really motivated to find a way, uh, of freeing oneself from that in, mm -hmm. into, um, yeah, into, into the highest peace. Uh, and that's really what the path is about. One of the reasons I called my last book Mindfulness, which, which goes, as you know, <laughs> into quite a bit of detail yeah. about the path of practice, I wanted to call it Mindfulness because in a way I wanted to reclaim that word for teachings in the service of enlightenment and awakening and not have it limited to the very good effect of just making one uh, feel better, you know, or a little calm or whatever. All, all the very positive benefits of mindfulness practice, you know, that are current now in a more secular way. But really the Buddha taught mindfulness as a path to awakening. So it's much more profound than simply coming to greater ease in one's life, although that's a value. Yeah, yeah. When you remember your I first... Was that, was that a... <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think for one of the most influential people in all of human history, I think that was a pretty good synopsis <laughs> in, in three minutes. Um, <laughs> That's that's kind of the daunting task of what I do is like, okay, okay, go. T tell the, the most important things that have changed your entire life in a concise period of period of time. Um, you know, when, when you think about yourself when you, you began your own meditation practice, what was your, you know, you alluded to this a little bit already in the conversation. What do you remember about your state of mind? You know, how do you judge the state of your psychological health? Um, when you were when you were first getting exposed to these ideas and to meditation as a practice, <laughs> um, I think I was reasonably balanced. Yeah, you know, uh, 
yeah, I was, I was reasonably balanced. I, I wasn't having any big kind of emotional crises other than that strong urge to understand my mind and what was going on. Um, and I was very inspired from very early on when I first met my teacher Manindra at that time in Bulgaria, there were very few Westerners. This was in 1967. Um, there, there were maybe seven or 10 Westerners in Bulgaria, you know, over the years, of course, that number expanded hugely, hundreds, yeah. thousands. Uh, so in this small group, when we met, when I first met Munindra, we were sitting in a circle and we went around. He asked us, why are you practicing? Yeah. And for me, it was very clear, even from the very beginning, that I was practicing for enlightenment, for awakening, for the whatever we want to call kind of the highest aspiration. Uh, so that's what was, that was deeply rooted uh, in me for some reason. And, you know, it's, this is just conjecture, but who knows, you know, over past lives, maybe I had been working towards this. But in any way, in, in this life, that, that was very strong from the beginning. Yeah. And I know, you know, you spent many years over there. Um, yeah. Talk about what, you know, when you were deep in the practice and you com committed, I mean, truly committed, mm -hmm. what was a day in the life like for you then? What, what do you remember about the discipline and the, you just mentioned what the goal was. I mean, you were clear on what you were trying to accomplish, which is right. no small feat. Um, <laughs> what, what was the, yeah. the habits and the discipline and the rituals that you were undertaking yeah. in order to achieve that? First to say that um, this was not part of any group structure. You know, so Munindra lived in Bulgaria. There were a group of us Westerners staying at what was called the Burmese Vihar or Burmese Rest House. Mm -hmm. Because at that time, Burma was closed, so there were no Burmese pilgrims. Yep. So a few Westerners were staying there. And we each practiced in our own way, you know, and uh, we would go either every day or every other day to see Munindra, report on our experience and then come back. So there was nothing organized. There was no group courses. There was no organization. It was just us as individuals undertaking our practice. Hmm. Uh, so for me, in the years that I was in, it was over a seven year period, uh, I would, um, there would be cycles of intensive practice for three, four or five months at a time. And then usually in the summer months, which got very hot in Bulgaria, uh, we would go up to the mountains, what we call the, the hill stations of the Himalayas. Mm -hmm. And so that was much less uh, intensive, you know, hanging out, doing some practice, but then coming back again to Bulgaria and doing another three, four, five months of intensive meditation. And that really entailed just all day sitting sitting practice for however long one sat and then walk, doing walking meditation and sitting and walking and sitting and walking. Uh, it took me quite a while. It took, it, um, it took me a fair amount of time to develop some concentration. Hmm. It's like when I, there are some people who are naturals. Yeah. You know, just their minds are naturally concentrated. They sit down. And they're there. That was not me. <laughs> I had studied philosophy, you know, as, as I mean, I like to think a lot, yeah. you know, I have a lot of questions. So when I began, I would just sit and think for an hour and enjoy it. <laughs> you know, the, hour, <laughs> the hour went quickly. I was entertaining myself, uh, but I wasn't getting very far in meditation. Then after some time, one kind of meditation practice, in addition to the practice of mindfulness or insight, uh, is a meditation on loving kindness. Yeah. And I got inspired 
to do that. I felt I felt I needed it. Yeah. Uh, so after some time, I did a six week intensive period of loving kindness meditation, which, in addition to developing that heart heart space, it is also a concentration practice. And so in doing that for that six weeks, that was the first time that I experienced to some degree a concentrated mind hmm. when everything just gets very easeful. There's no longer the same struggle to keep bringing the mind back. and It doesn't feel like so much work yeah. when the mind reaches some level of concentration. And I remember thinking at one point as I was doing that, Oh, this is why people like to meditate. <laughs> because when the mind is concentrated, it's just very easeful. It's, it's a kind of happiness that is just much uh, more complete and fulfilling than the kind of happiness that we are more familiar with, like from different sense pleasures and, you know, enjoyment, you know, of worldly things. This is just much deeper and more complete. So when I finally, you know, was able to concentrate to some extent, uh, that's when the meditation really, really began to unfold. Uh, and during those years in India, there were times, you know, after a couple of these sessions of four or five months at a time, three, three to five months, um, yeah, I could, I could sit for many hours at a time easily. Yeah. Uh, so it was all very, and all of this was completely new to me at that time. So, and I was young. Yeah. <laughs> with a lot of energy. <laughs> Unlike now, <laughs> old and not so much energy. <laughs> uh, so when I look back to those years, I just, I just remember feeling so contented in what I was doing. You know, I felt, at the time, I felt I could just, I could just be here forever. Yeah. Uh, did that yeah. answer your question? I yes. Uh, yes. I don't know what you asked anymore. <laughs> I, I think for some, you know, people that have never glimpsed the psychological state that you just mentioned, it might be difficult to understand why a person would be so contented, like you just said, to spend days, months, years in that kind of a mind space. And, you know, in thinking about your life at that time, mindfulness and meditation was not in vogue, as I understand it. It wasn't all the rage. There weren't magazine covers detailing the hope of mindfulness for the civilization. Did you always have a trailblazer independence? You know, like to call your family and tell them i'm a you know co former columbia student opting to now sit all day and <laughs> contemplate the, the state of my mind what do you remember about those conversations how how were you able to i don't know muster the the independence to decide that this is what mattered to you there's something deeply jungian about this like that this was a calling or something like that yeah it, it definitely was and there was not even any question in my mind. You know, I, I was so immersed in it and so fulfilled in it. And it was just clear to me that this is what I wanted to do. Mm. Fortunately, uh, my father died when I was quite young. So at that time, uh, my mother was still alive. And, um, fortunately, she herself had a very independent spirit. And, um, there was no problem. Unlike many of my friends yeah. whose parents went nuts, my yeah. friends in India, you know, who just couldn't bear the fact that their kids were spending all this time. My mother was, was fine with it. Not only that, uh, she came to visit me in Boykai. She, she was really a world traveler. Yeah. Uh, she had been in India before I had. She, she, she used to travel on, uh, freighters around the world. So 
I was very fortunate in that regard. There was a lot of support. Uh, other more distant relatives did not understand. Yeah. But, but the most important one did. And that was, that was a great support for me. I didn't have any conflict on that front. Yeah. And I'm really grateful for that. Yeah. I can imagine that that would make it significantly easier. easier. Yeah. And if you had friends yeah. that were getting a lot of pushback from yes. families that had invested a lot in them yes. to be, I mean, you don't go to Columbia without a, yes. a lot of ambition and talent. And yeah. Um, yeah. so uh, how, when, when your family that, you know, it sounds like your mom was kind of a, kind of a badass and a cool woman. Um, when other family members of yours, or even maybe with your mother, when she would ask you, you know, why, why has this resonated so much with you? Why have you, why are you deciding to dedicate, you know, the foreseeable future, your, your life to this? How did you articulate that to them? What, what was the story you told? Well, first at that time, I did not have a vision for my life. Yeah. I mean, I had no idea. <laughs> how things were going to unfold. And I, I wasn't even thinking about it. I was yeah. just totally in that experience. And as I said, it's, a, it's just so fulfilling. Uh, I didn't have that many conversations with other family members. Uh, but when my mother came to visit me in Bulgaria, and she met my teacher, she met my friends there who were also involved in this, uh, even though at that time she didn't, really get into the practice yeah uh but uh she understood she she could <laughs> to, to use a colloquialism she could feel the vibe yeah yeah you know, it was a very loving vibe we were all doing what we love doing you know and she met my teacher and one of the things that i think uh yeah. softened her up a bit <laughs> is um in india as you probably know uh, mothers are revered. <laughs> a lot of respect is given to mothers, which is not <laughs> necessarily the case in our culture. Yeah. <laughs> so I think she kind of, so all of the people there were just, you know, you know oh, Mataji. <laughs> you know? So she was getting a lot of respect and appreciation for being my mother. <laughs> yeah. Not because I was special, just because she was a mother. Yeah. Uh, so I think that also kind of opened her. Oh yeah, this, this is not so crazy. It's not so wild. Something, something valuable is happening here. Later, when I came back to the States and started teaching, she actually came to a few retreats, you know, and so she, she had some level of interest in it. She, you know, she never became a professional meditator. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but she understood, you know, and, and she had, she had an interest and appreciation for it. So again, that was very supportive, very supportive for me. Yeah. The, the Joseph before the, you know, deciding that the, the path towards enlightenment, the, the commitment to enlightenment was the path for you before that you had the clarity that it sounds like eventually came. What were your religious convictions? You know, I, you said you were raised in, I think, a culturally Jewish home, but how would you have described yourself before, before the, the clarity came? And then how would you have described yourself once the clarity, uh, you know, descended upon you? What, what is the, <laughs> what's the difference between the two in, the, in a general worldview and outlook? Yeah. So I remember. Uh, I think this was my first year at Columbia. Uh, I think part of my mind was always, even in high school and, and then later in college, uh, I had a very inquiring mind. Yeah. You know, it kind of, uh, just my mind naturally tends to investigation, which in some way is a hindrance for concentration. So as I said, at first, I just like to think about it. <laughs> <laughs> so I remember my freshman year in college, I don't know what prompted it, but I remember there was one week where I was obsessed 
My mind was obsessed with coming to some conclusion about whether God exists or not. And it just felt to me the most burning question that my, the whole course of my life depended on my answer to that question. So this is a freshman in our college. And before that, I didn't, that was the first time that it got so focused. Unfortunately, I don't remember my conclusion at the end of the week. <laughs> and I probably hadn't come to any in and kind of the, the fire of the, the burning question just must have faded away. <laughs> Yeah, but but it gives some indication of kind of the quality of my mind at that time. You know, just just this intense looking, wanting to understand, realizing I didn't understand what happened afterwards. Once once I found this path of practice and a, a, a gradual deepening of my understanding of the Buddhist teaching, mm. which. From the very beginning, it just it just made so much sense to me, you know. Uh, and just an aside with regard to the teachings, one of the things that I really loved about them is the Buddha never asked us to believe. Yeah, he said, "Check it out for yourself. This is what I've discovered about the nature of suffering and how to free oneself from suffering. You know, do the practice and see for yourself whether it works." So I really, that resonated with me because I wasn't looking for just the belief system. Yeah. Right? Uh, so as I got into the practice, I really, my inner state, it so resonated both with the teachings of the Buddha in general and my own experience, my slowly deepening experience in meditation. Uh, that I, I just came to a place of um, understanding ra rather than that seeking out of confusion. You know, at that point, I really felt like I had found the path. Hmm. And so there's a, just a lot of confidence in that. And from that time, um, there was really never any doubt, which in classical Buddhist teachings, can be a, is a great hindrance to meditative, uh, experience because, you know, if the mind is plagued by doubt, so it's likened to a, a thorny mind, you know, how a thorn just keeps jabbing. Doubt is like that. And, and we don't go anyplace. Yeah. Uh, so I, I was fortunate in that I, I really didn't have any doubt about the path. Yeah. Then it was just doing the work, which is another whole story. <laughs> <laughs> and it, when when you when the doubt was removed, when the clarity came, you know, I think to a Western mind, we it, it would be common to view that as you have found God. You know, you you have you have answered that question, or you have found your you know, religious trajectory. How do you make sense of that now for yourself? I mean, you were this inquisitive, honestly, I, I, there's a lot, I, I, I feel like a lot of my, I had a lot of that in myself as well. When I was a very, very serious young man trying to understand this, this world, um, did it feel to you like you had answered that question when that clarity came to you and you realized what you were going to be dedicating your life to? Or did you still have, and maybe still have, you know, more of a, an agnostic uncertainty about the totality of things? No, it did answer the question in a way, although as I understood more and more of the Buddhist teachings, uh, it is non-theistic. Yeah. You know, so in the Buddhist understanding the question of whether god exists or doesn't exist is not even a question yeah <laughs> you know and so i don't use i don't use that terminology and back then it, that i wasn't using that language you know of finding god or that 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 
never occurred to me to frame things in that way. Yeah. It, it was more, you know, in Buddhism, the, the term for the teachings, for the truth, for the way things are, is this, the Sanskrit word is dharma, you know, D-H-A-R-M-A. And really, that's what the Buddha did. The Buddha taught the dharma. He taught just the nature of things, how, th- how things are. Uh, and so that became the framework. That, that kind of understanding and vocabulary then became the framework of the whole path. It's just this ongoing exploration of the dharma. Yeah. On deeper and deeper levels. Yeah. To me, in reading, you know, your work and other Buddhists, this is one of the things that I so appreciated about the philosophy in general is that as best I could understand it, they were attempting to utilize essentially what is the scientific method as it applies to the human mind and the human experience. And yes. I would love to give you an opportunity to to speak to that because, you know, you were a philosophy, you were studying philosophy at that time, you know, that that's an intense, independent area of academic discipline. You know, when you think about what you just mentioned, the Dharma and the the invitation really that the Buddha was seemingly offering to audiences to look for yourself um, and conclude with an affirmation or a disconfirmation about his assessment of the nature of things and the nature of of a of human existence. Talk about that if you can. You know, the, sure. you just you just you just mentioned what the Dharma is, and I'd love to maybe just give you a, a platform to try as best you can to you know inform a Western audience what that's all about. Yeah, so I'll give a very <laughs> simple example. It's not going to actually take very long. Yeah. And I, I, I think it'll, it'll illustrate the nature of the teachings, the nature of the exploration. And in a way, the obviousness of it that we often overlook. So just an exa- as an example, the Buddha said that when you, when you sit down and observe your mind, your body, the world, you see that everything is changing, right? That things do not last. Things are arising and passing and transforming continually. But the change is the nature of phenomena. So that's fairly easy to observe on many levels. It can be observed on the macro level. It can be observed on the micro level, wherever we look. Yeah. Right? So that's not hard to for people to understand, maybe at first intellectually, but it's, that's, it's not an esoteric truth hmm. that things change. So then the Buddha made this very uh, clear um, deduction in a way born of experience that if we cling to that which in its nature changes, we suffer. <laughs> you know, if we're trying to hold on to summer and it becomes winter, we suffer. If we hold on to youth and we become old, we suffer. Yeah. There, there are a million examples because it's in the very nature. So somebody once described that sense of trying to hold on to changing phenomena as rope burn. Yeah. <laughs> if yeah. somebody's pulling a rope through your hand and you're trying to hold on tightly, what happened? You get rope burned. Yeah. Well, this is how very often we're living our lives. You know, we try to hold on to what's pleasant you know, and push away what's unpleasant. And so we're, we're constantly in this push pull, uh, relationship to phenomena. The practice is settling back and allowing for the experience of change, the flow of change to happen and becoming one with the flow yeah. rather than trying to obstruct it. Or So this seems, as I say, this is not esoteric. 
of course, integrating it fully into our lives is not a whole matter. <laughs> Re remembering it is the hard part. Yeah. But, but understanding it is not that difficult. Yeah. And I'd love to talk about that aspect of integration because these are profound insights that I think, you know, even in my own life, I have sat down and read, you know, Buddhist insights and been impressed with their, you know, clar clarity and accuracy. And then months or years will go by with me just being captured by that push and pull. I mean, that's the yes. thing, yes. typical, uh, predictable human life. As a teacher, as someone who has you know, dedicated so much of his his life to this practice, what is the role of you know integration and practice in really having these ideas take hold and you know be rooted in one's soul in one's nature? What and maybe the best way to ask this is is to ask you how did you do that? What 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 were what were what do you think is required to be able to right. create a mind or help to create a mind that is awake? Right. So there are two two responses that come come to mind. One is there's a reason it's called Dharma practice. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> because it needs practice. <laughs> you know, and it's just like learning anything. It's like learning a musical instrument or a sport or you know, when you start out, it's awkward and make a lot of mistakes and doesn't flow very easily. But as we practice, it gets more and more e easeful and flowing and we become uh, more fulfilled in it. So practice is a key word. Mm. Okay, given that, then the question is, what is it that we're practicing? Right? Which I think gets to the heart of your question. Yeah. And Again, the Buddhist teaching is just so clear. One of, one of the foundational teachings in all the schools of Buddhism, this is, this is just, as I say, foundational, is something which he called, uh, the Noble Eightfold Path. You know, and it, it, it lays out eight steps or eight arenas of practice. So some of them, some of them are ethical. You know, and ethics is an important part of the path. Yeah. Uh, and so things like not killing or stealing or sexual misconduct, you know, just basic behavior of non harming. Yeah. Yeah. And so there is, there are, uh, formal outlines of, you know, which actions are harmful, of course, suffering to ourselves or others. So abstaining from that, that's one one aspect of the Eightfold Path. Another is, and one which I found hugely interesting and helpful and pervasive, one step of the Eightfold Path is right speech. And it's right at the center, it's right, it's right at the center of the, of the eight yeah. steps. We speak, you know, we <laughs> in our lives we talk a lot. Until I came across these teachings, I never paid much attention to assessing the value of what I was saying. Yeah. You know, the words would just come tumbling out. Well, right speech really gives some very clear guidelines of what furthers one's development on the path and what hinders. So just, just as, you know, quick. Yeah, please. Exam example of right speech. It's obviously not lying, a commitment to truth. Not speaking harshly. Yeah. You know, or, or harsh or yeah, abrasive lang language. Uh, not gossiping. So, uh, just, just as a, a little story taking me back to Peace Corps days. Yeah. I come across this eightfold path. You know, and getting interested, this really pre-meditation for the most part. But I read this about, you know, right speech. So for a while I made the resolution 
I'm not going to speak about any third person. I'm not going to speak to someone about somebody else. Yeah. It was amazing. Ninety-five <laughs> percent of my speech was eliminated. <laughs> it was amazing. Yeah. And of course, I had no idea before I had done that that so much of what I was saying was that, right? And right, even then, at the very beginning of my interest in all this, I noticed that when I refrain from speaking about others. Even if it was not, you know, particularly uh, divisive or harmful, mm. but just gossip. Yeah. Uh, what I noticed was that my mind became a lot less judgmental of of people because I wasn't giving voice to the to all the you know ordinary <laughs> everyday judgments that we have about almost yeah. everybody. And as I stopped judging others so much, I also saw that there was a lot less self-judgment. You know, so I really saw early on the the enormous power of this practice. And the last element of right speech, and I think at this point it's my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> it says to avoid useless talk. <laughs> yeah. And there's a word in Pali, which is the ancient language that the Buddhist texts you know, are in. So the Pali word for useless talk, it's like anamanapiya. It sounds just like what it is. Sampapalapa. <laughs> <laughs> you know. So to me, I, I love catching myself. And it's just so common, you know, I can, I can be just hanging out with friends, you know, just normal, you know, socializing. And I can see so often, I'll just say something that is completely useless. Yeah. It, it has no point at all, except to say, here I am. Yeah. <laughs> so when I catch that, it's so great. I, Oh, I don't need to say that. It's useless. Yeah. And I can feel kind of the energy that comes from that restraint. It's like a conservation of energy instead of it just spilling out in, in these useless words. Yeah. So right speech is one aspect of how we integrate the path into our lives in a powerful way. It's been a tremendously fruitful exercise. Um, and then there are aspects of the Eightfold Path which are the cultivation of, we could say, wholesome or skillful thought patterns and letting go of those which are not. And so the Buddha is saying, cultivate thoughts um, of letting go, of loving kindness, of compassion, you know, rather than of greed. Yeah. or of ill will, or of cruelty. So we can watch our thoughts, and if we've developed some skill in seeing our own thoughts, then we can see, okay, which are, which are the kinds of thoughts that I want to cultivate, and which are the kinds of thoughts that I just want to let go of. Yeah. So all of this is part of the path, and, and as you can see, it's, it really is integrated into how we're living. It's not just sitting on the cushion. Yeah. Yeah. I'd love to maybe transition to the, the time in your life when you began to bring a lot of these ideas into the U S and what you remember about that time from your life in terms of whether there was, you know, pushback or difficulties. I'm thinking about, you know, I'm sure you see this at your retreats, you know, in the, in the last, especially few years, I think people psychologically are often really struggling and are under enormous stress in times of change, in times of the lockdowns in times in terms of the isolation that people have experienced and 
you know, I'm wondering for yourself, if, if for for average people that have not felt the call that that you have that you know, has spent so many years kind of cultivating these ideas and making them part of who you are you must still interact with people that are not necessarily long-term practitioners but are just kind of coming to you for practical advice you know for for an, as a teacher you know so, to begin to try to mitigate daily suffering um that they might be experiencing and i know you've spoken about this in in prior conversations but i'd love to bring it up again now H- how do you shepherd those conversations you know when, when you have new students that show up at your retreat centers or just people that you interact with in life who in the past even you know 2 years or so are dealing with stress and um you know, illness or just psychological dis-ease, where do you recommend that they start? You know, how do you, and maybe this is the philosophical aspect of me asking a former philosophy student and you, you know, what's the, what's the, what's the first um, step forward in the right direction in your mind that, that yeah. might begin to, to help people ease their own inner suffering well i think that here is where we can really see the value of this whole movement of secular mindfulness yeah which is not engaged that they don't they're not presenting it as a path to enlightenment or awakening or even as particularly as a spiritual practice but they've extracted the methodology of mindfulness to apply in just people's everyday stressful situation and as you know uh, uh, a good friend is john kabat zinn who yeah. you know started the mindfulness-based stress reduction which has become huge yeah and he actually came up with that idea on retreat at our meditation center hmm. so he was thinking about that i was thinking about other things when he should have been <laughs> meditating <laughs> he was creating this whole vision which, yeah <laughs> but it turned out to be just incredibly helpful for so many people and so we can take the methodology of mindfulness right just to its most basic you could even say non-spiritual aspect but just introducing people to a way of relating to their own minds and emotions so it's not it's not a um The key to it is the understanding that what it is that's arising in our mind, that's not the key issue. Hmm. The key issue is how we're relating to what's happening in our minds. Hmm. Okay. So that just that, <laughs> just that is everything. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so as people come in with all the stress and the difficult emotions, you know, it's really uh, opening to them to the possibility of relating to them in a different and more skillful, healthy way. So instead of either condemning them or having a lot of aversion to these difficult emotions, you know, or suppressing them, it's really learning how to open to the feeling of them. You know, so there's stress in the mind and the body, there's uh, distress, there's um, anger or frustration or whatever it may be. Mm. The practice of mindfulness, just in this most basic form, is learning how, okay, we can feel this, can I be mindful of it? And mindfulness means being aware of it without attachment and without aversion. You know, so it's really taking, in a way, it's taking interest in the mind state itself. Oh, anger feels like this. Sadness feels like this. You know, so there's a kind of interest in it rather than the complete identification with it. Yeah. 
And, and it's that identification with all these emotions that is the cause of the suffering. You know, and so mindfulness introducing people to how what mindfulness is and how it can be used in these situations has just proved, you know, tremendously beneficial for uh, it's huge now. Yeah, you know, this this whole movement uh, because people are, are getting so much benefit from it. Yeah. Um, yeah, and so it's, it's it's always important as a teacher, regardless of where people are along this path, whether they're just starting, you know, or further along. As a teacher, what I found, it's always important to actually make the connection. You could almost say the emotional connection with where people are. There has to be the acknowledgement and the, the, as I said, the connection of what people's current experience is. Once that connection is made and people feel that I, or who's ever, you know, in a teaching role actually hears them. Yeah. You know, that, that then, that's when it becomes possible then to say, Oh, well, you know, as you feel in this, if you try relating to it in this way or do this or do that, then there can be a lot of openness to trying it. Yeah. But if there's not that initial, that initial connection, uh, it usually doesn't work because people don't, people don't feel heard. Yeah. In terms of where they are. I have heard, uh, John kabat if I remember correctly, I, I think that he would bring up this idea that you know, in his mind, there was a sixth sense that humans can develop, which is awarenessing, you know, the ability to witness um, right. and to be able to separate the fluctuating weather like patterns that can pepper the sky of your mind with what is always there for you, which is awareness. Mm -hmm. And that um, part of, if, if I'm understanding your, you know, kind of outlook on this, part of the discipline of the the teachings is is in, enhancing one's capacity to be able to tap into that truth. Exactly, exactly. So just in <clears throat> uh, going along with that, I'll, I'll just mention one really simple technique. Yeah, which. Not everybody resonates with, you know, so uh, I offer it as a suggestion for people to try if they like, and it may, it may work for them, it may not. And that's not a reflection about their capacity to meditate. Yeah. Because it's just one particular method and there are many methods, you know, yeah. and we have to find the ones that resonate with us. But in this particular method, uh, it's what we call the tool of mental noting where we're just making a very soft mental note in the mind for whatever's arising. So, for example, even we start with the breathing, just as we breathe in and feel, feeling the sensations of the breath, just have that very, really a whisper in the mind. It, it's very subtle, just in, out, in, out. And then if a thought arises, oh, thinking, Thinking. Sound arises. Hearing. In. Out. We're feeling impatient. Impatience. Impatience. Yeah. So, so we're just tracking with the note what it is that's arising moment to moment. And just a further little subtlety using this tool, we have to watch the tone of the note because the tone <laughs> of the note will illuminate the quality of our awareness. Mm. So in other words, if we're, no, if we're noting, thinking, thinking, thinking. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a pretty good indication that we're not being mindful, <laughs> that we really are having a lot of aversion to the fact that we're thinking. So in that way, too, that this particular tool, it, it shows us the quality of our mind and keeps us on track with what's arising. So, so that's just one, as I say, it's just one method, and, and there are many methods. 
Yeah. I know that um, one of the, I think, criticisms that is often leveled ag- against these kind of practices is that they're too, I don't know if accepting of the status quo is the nature of things. And I'd love to give you an, an opportunity to address this in the following sense, which is that th- these practices are are in an you know an inner internal investigation of one's own mind while also attempting to increase one's ability to separate and not necessarily identify with the non-voluntary chatter that and states of emotion and and neuroticism that you know kind of inflict upon um an individual's mind and that that is that is part of the process the the criticism would be that it isn't if i for example if somebody were to come to see you who is experiencing is in an abusive relationship and that is what is triggering a lot of their psychological uh, unwellness that it isn't in my mind i'm sure your advice that the you know the purpose of these practices is to endure anything it is to accurately diagnose one's own state of mind while also incorporating wisdom in decision making and uh one's life trajectory and i, I don't mean to put that those words in your mouth but i, I wanted to give you an opportunity you. to speak that to that <laughs> You just answered the question beautifully. <laughs> no, that's exactly it. It's not. It's, so I'll just I'll take a little uh, uh, just another tack, you know, from what you said. But I think you you really did express it. It's it, it's not a disengagement from the world at all. Yeah. You know? So a couple a couple of things uh, come to mind. Just to highlight what you just said, what this is kind of a, just in very broad terms, it's learning to respond rather than react. Mm. So instead of being triggered and then for whatever, whatever the cause is, and then just acting out of our own reactivity, which often obscures clear seeing. Yeah. Right? It's much more skillful, just as you say, to kind of drop in and try to get as clear a picture of what the whole situation is and then respond from that clarity. Right. So it, it's responding rather than reacting. From another side, and this, this is something that, um, I've just found deeply meaningful, you know, in terms of this whole path and how the inner relates to the outer. Yeah. So one of the things that we learn through meditative practice is to be able to be with painful experiences mindfully. So, so just very some pain in the body, which certainly comes up at different times in meditation. So instead of contracting or aversion or trying to avoid, we can say, oh, it's okay to feel, it is unpleasant. It's not that it makes it pleasant, but that it's okay to feel unpleasantness. Yeah. Right. Which goes against our conditioning. You know, our conditioning is avoid unpleasantness at all costs. Yeah. So meditation is quite different than that. It's saying, no, this is part of life. Our whole life is just a sequence of pleasant experiences, unpleasant experiences. Can we develop that equanimity of mind that just is open to both? As we develop an ability to be with painful experiences in ourselves, and then, as I say, instead of reacting, responding appropriately, you know, yeah. 
you put your hand in fire. You don't want, oh, painful, painful. You want to take your hand out. But our ability to open to the painful or the uncomfortable in ourselves then allows us not to shy away from the suffering of others. Yeah. Right? Because we've developed the capacity to be with the unpleasant or the suffering aspect of things. And it's precisely our ability to come close to suffering, which is the wellspring of compassion. Compassion comes from our ability to come close to suffering. You know, so I'll, I'll just, I'll give you an example, which goes back to my India days. Mm-hmm. Anybody who's been in India knows that uh, there are just a lot of these uh, untended dogs, you know, who are in pitiful conditions, yeah. pitiable conditions, mange and starving. It's really it's horrible to see. Yeah. You know, nobody's taking care of them. So, and they're just around. You, it's, you can't avoid them. Yeah. And so I noticed something in myself. So sometimes in between my times of intensive practice, you know, I'd be going into the Bulgaria, the local tea shop, you know, having tea and some sweets or whatever. And of course, everything's open, you know, having the open. And so all these dogs are around. And I just noted two very different responses in my mind. When I was not open, when I was not willing to take the suffering in of those dogs, it was like, oh, oh, just let me enjoy my tea and my sweet. I don't want to deal with this. Right. So it was kind of that pulling back and contraction, which itself was an unpleasant state. Yeah. But. And at other times, I was just really open to looking and seeing and letting the suffering of these dogs in, you know. So at that time, my heart was really open. And then I was moved just in some very simple way, you know, so I'd give them a little food or something like that. But the difference between myself closing off to the suffering and my opening to the suffering it was the difference was so dramatic. Yeah. And, and to see how the feeling of compassion and the acts that come from compassion come from our ability to open to the pain that's there. And we practice that by opening to the pain within ourselves. Yeah. Right. Um, I'll, g- I'll give you one, just one more. Please, this please. Was, this was quite a, quite a significant moment in my meditation practice. So, you know, we all are conditioned differently in terms of uh, what kind of mind states create suffering within us. So for me, I would say the primary difficult emotion uh, was fear. (laughs) Just just, uh, big things, little things. And at one point, in my, when I was doing intensive practice, this fear just became so overwhelming that I was afraid to go from sitting position to standing position. It was completely irrational. You know, there's, there was, I was not being threatened in any way, yeah. but it was just some conditioning in my mind that suddenly the meditation had exposed in full glory, you know. So I worked a lot with fear over many years. And then at one point, I was on retreat. I was doing walking meditation. And a lot of this fear was coming up. And something shifted. And the shift was expressed in a thought that came to my mind. If this fear is here for the rest of my life, it's okay. And that was the first moment in all of those years that I actually accepted it. I thought I was being mindful before then because I could notice. I knew it was there, you know, fear, fear, fear. 
but there was always the filter of aversion and wanting it to go away. Yeah. Which is not mindfulness. It's not acceptance. And this, this points to an important distinction between recognition and mindfulness. If we can recognize something, but that doesn't mean we're being mindful. It's, mindful means accepting it without aversion, without yeah. holding. So in that moment, if this fear is here for the rest of my life, it's okay. But it was amazing. In that moment of acceptance, the whole mess of fear just seemed to wash through me. It's like I was able finally just to let it go. Yeah. And it doesn't mean that fear never arises again, because it does, but my relationship to it has changed completely. Yeah. You know. So now when it comes, oh yeah, it's it's okay. And it's okay became my new favorite mantra. <laughs> Whatever's all right, it's okay. So just let me feel it. Let me be with it. So yeah. that, that became a kind of inner coach for mindfulness. Yeah. You know, I, I think what comes to mind, you know, just selfishly in, in hearing that story, I have a, a close friend who uh, is about my age who lost his son in a boating accident in a canoe mm. accident um yeah. about a month ago randomly on mm. as it turns out on my birthday um and i know you know this is i know you work with people you just told your own story about your your struggle with fear and a, a lot of people must come to you and to come to you, come to your centers because they're hopeful that you and your teachers and the ideas that you espouse and the practices that you commit yourselves to might be able to help them. And you know, we were just talking about fear. And I know, I know my friend and his family are going through a lot of grief right now. Um, you know, your, your story that you just told about the years of the shift that you mentioned how how for for people who are like my friend who show up to you who are mm -hmm. their their minds are really at war with themselves for you know, the guilt the the grief and i think anyone who loves him or you know loved you when you were dealing with a lot of fear would would wish for that shift to come as soon as possible you know, to, to not needlessly suffer. Um, how do you tend to shepherd those conversations and the instruction with people who come to you like that? Is, is it mm -hmm. to tell stories like the one you just told? Is it, is it something else? What, what, what comes yeah. to mind, if anything, about how you would deal with something like that? Yeah. Um. So, speaking specifically about grief, this is a tremendously uh, difficult and challenging situation because obviously, I mean, this, you know, the loss of a child, the loss of anybody, you know, that uh, for whom we have a lot of love just calls up these very strong emotions. Yeah. And the heart is so vulnerable, you know, at that time and, and often overwhelmed by these emotions. So the first thing for me in being with people going through that, the first thing is just making space for people to feel what they're feeling. Yeah. You know, but that, because it is such a, such a powerful, you know, such a powerful emotion uh, and so challenging, so difficult. And then, and a lot of this is a question of timing. At some point, I think I would inquire whether people are ready to, ready and interested in investigating the nature of grief. Yeah. If they really want to explore, and sometimes people are not ready. You know, they're, they're still in some process and they don't have yet 
the inner space to be able to do that. Yeah. So that has to be respected and honored. But often people are not even aware that there could be a way of investigating it. Right. And so I like to just inquire, you know, is this something you would like to explore together or not? You know, yeah. is, is it not the right time? If people feel that they would like to, then there are some, I feel, some very interesting uh, investigations that could help to open things up. But again, I want to emphasize the timing is everything. Yeah. Uh, and if people are not yet at that place, that's totally fine. They're in their own process and they need to honor that process. But if people are interested, I'll just give you a few examples of yeah. the kind of investigation. And this actually comes right out of the Buddha's teachings, uh, which I extrapolated from the Buddha's teachings. Yeah. To see the difference between the feeling of grief and the feeling of loss that these are two different things and that we can and that generally the feeling of grief is the non we have not yet accepted in ourselves the feeling of loss right and so the grief is the response to that the grief is just we just can't accept it yeah but just to make that distinction and then, you know, to say, okay, is it possible to actually become mindful, you know, be, become aware to feel into, oh, this is, this is the feeling of loss with a kind of acceptance. You know, it's unpleasant. It doesn't make it pleasant by any means. It's yeah. an unpleasant feeling and it's very tender, you know. But it is possible to settle into an awareness of it, right? As opposed to a non-acceptance or a pushing away or not yeah. wanting to feel it. So that, that's one, one place to enter into. Another place is sometimes people are in this grieving process for a long time because they are conflating the feeling of grief with the feeling of love. And they feel as if they let go of the grief, it means mm. that they're letting go of love. Yeah. But these are two very different feelings. Yeah. And the love can be there. It can be there when the person is alive. It can be there when the person has died. Yeah. The, the feeling of love doesn't have to go away. So just to, you know, to suggest to people, okay, can, can you really separate out these two? And to me, what's interesting is when people are feeling into the love that they have to, to ask of them at that time, when you're feeling the love, are you grieving? And I would suggest that you're not, mm. because they're two different feelings. Yeah. But they've gotten so people people generally, and we haven't been taught how to really investigate and separate out what's going on, particularly in a situation like that that's so so powerful and so just so deep in us. Yeah. But there are these ways of investigating and beginning to make some space and beginning to come to some peace because we can come to experience the feeling of loss and, and gradually just, it's okay to feel it. You know, so that's like with the fear, it's okay. Even though it's unpleasant. Yeah. And then just, as I say, with love, to see that 
we still feel the love. Uh, and so there are different, different things like that for, for if people are ready to do that. Yeah. And as I say, everybody has to, has to really trust their own process and see in themselves. Yeah. You know, where they are and, and whether there's interest in doing that. Yeah. I think that's very wise. And thank you for that. Um, I know we're getting towards the end of our, our time together and there, there are just a couple, couple things I'd love to additional things I would love to go over with you. And one that came to mind, which I, I think I've heard you say in multiple interviews, you know, we live in, um, you know, a culture that in many ways is living in opposition or in, in behavior in a way that is chasing you know, external validation, external um, successes, and is not particularly oriented necessarily, at least a large chunk of the population in our country, to the deep wellness that can exist in people who are in a, you know, a really positive psychological state. And I, I think I heard you say once, and you may have been parroting the, the Buddha, that it, it's the state of peace that is the ultimate you know, uh, psychological state for a human being. I don't know if you agree with that statement, but you know, this is a culture show largely. And I, we talk a lot about issues that are going on in America and in Western civilization. And I, I just, I'd like to give you a, a, a chance to, to speak to the, um, at least maybe for, just for you, why um, a, a life of, of peace, the things that you glimpsed in your discipline uh, clicked into being true for you as being worth dedicating one's life to. It's a long and meandering statement right there, I know, but the, the, uh, just the concept of peace in general being of paramount importance um, in a life well lived in a life well experienced. I'd love to just give you a chance to, to, to speak to that a little bit. <laughs> One of the things I learned from my teacher, Muninja, yeah, he had this unique ability. Uh, so people, uh, people would come all the time and ask questions. <laughs> and what I learned from him as a teaching skill is he would just say whatever he wanted to say, whether it answered the question or not. <laughs> so I learned that that's very useful. <laughs> so I'm going, I'm going to basically give a please, little wrap. Please, and yeah. I'm not sure it answers your question, but <laughs> it's what came to mind as you were asking it. <laughs> that's, that's good enough for me. <laughs> and I think, and the reason it, it came to mind because, and I think this would be a good kind of conclusion to our conversation. Yeah. As people are beginning the practice of mindfulness, or not only beginning, but even people who have been practicing for quite a while, I think a really important question to ask is, what am I learning from being mindful? Yeah. So it doesn't just become a technique that maybe we you know, feel good when we're doing it or whatever. And then it's like a hobby. Yeah. Right. It's a, I think a very a probing question for each of us is, well, what am I learning? Yeah. From paying attention. So I'm, I want to just give a quick <laughs> survey of the kinds of things that I've learned. And yeah. Anybody can learn from paying attention. It's starting with some very simple things. If we're paying attention to our lives and our actions, we begin to notice what it feels like, the difference between what it feels like when we're being generous and when we're being stingy. Mm. How does it feel? I think if people really look to see their own mind state at those two different times when we, we are just being generous. We have that generous impulse and we give 
it feels good. Yeah. You know, it, it's, it's a wholesome state of mind. It makes us feel happy. Yeah. And when we're holding on, stingy, or we don't feel good. So that's very contracted, right? So this is something we can learn from being mindful to those two different situations, right? So then that becomes an impetus to practice generosity so that we are happier in our lives. Yeah. yeah. You know, and more peaceful because of that. How do we feel when we're being inclusive and when we're being exclusionary, right? In terms of our relationships with other people. So I'll just give you one short little story. Back in my India days, when there were just a few of us there, at one time, uh, this again was in between periods of intensive practice. We were just gathering around friends and somebody, a woman there had a guitar. And so we were sitting around the evening and uh, she, had, she had made up a song about each of us <laughs> you know, who were there. And my just anticipation was that it was going to be a kind of funny roast. <laughs> you know? But she did something quite the opposite in her song. She just spoke about the good qualities she saw in everybody, you know, and the, the good things about each person. Yeah. First, it was just so shocking for me because <laughs> it was so not what I expected. Yeah. And it just pointed again. Yeah. When we're inclusive, when we include people in our lives, we feel good. Yeah. And when we are keeping people out, making them other. It doesn't feel good. And this, our country could be well served if people would learn this lesson. Yeah. You know, because there's so much divisiveness and so much creating other. Uh, but that's something we can, we don't have to take this on faith. This is, this is the power of what we can learn from being mindful yeah. of our own experience. Yeah. Right? We check it out for ourselves. How does it feel when the mind is concentrated and when it's restless? <laughs> so, so again, all of these things, what are we actually learning from being mindful? And then, you know, the whole, all the insights that we have about non-attachment to that, which is changing all the time, you know, is a cause of peace. Yeah. Uh, and so all along the way from, the very ordinary activities of our lives to the deepest meditative experiences, we begin to see for ourselves, not, not because of what somebody else said or what we have to believe. We see it in our own experience. Oh, this is the cause of happiness. Yeah. This brings peace to my mind. And the mind, the Buddha said, there's no higher happiness than peace. And as we begin to experience different levels of that, we see the truth of it. Yeah. You know, there's just something. It's like we come to rest. We just come to rest in the midst or in the embrace of life. Yeah. So it's not that life disappears, but we're at rest. We're at peace right in the midst of it all. Yeah. Uh, and so to me, that's just an extraordinary thing. Yeah. I think that's a good place to end. Um, you know, Joseph, I, I just want to say, you, know, you must know this by how much I was harassing you over the last year. This is a huge honor for me to do this and um, to get an opportunity to allow you to tell your story and to share your, you know, your wisdom and your life experience with a larger audience. And I know I speak for many people and having a lot of gratitude for you and what you have dedicated yourself to and the ethics you have committed yourself to. Um, it has been such a pleasure to do this and to meet you. And I, I just want to convey that to you and say, thank you. Okay, um, thank you. And 
I invite everyone to join me along this path. <laughs> it's a blast. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best incentive there is. Um, thank you, man. Thank you so yeah. much for doing this. It was Thanks. great to meet you. This was great. Thanks, Joseph. Thank you for listening to this episode of Keep Talking. If you're finding value in this podcast, please consider supporting the show via the links below on Venmo, PayPal, or Patreon. Your support helps to make these conversations possible.